Welcome back to the Bluegrass this beautiful March afternoon. I'm out with Gunner and Pearl, two awesome 15 week old Labrador Retriever puppies who happen to be litter mates. Okay? So uh, I'm gonna let you guys kind of tag along while I do an obedience session with these two. And we're gonna discuss uh, kind of the pros and cons of attempting to raise uh, litter mates to you know mature into happy, healthy, well-adjusted dogs. Okay, So now as I'm working these dogs, I want you guys to kind of take note of the way I interact with the dogs, the methodology that I'm using to try to bring out the best in the dogs, okay? Uh, and then, you know, like post below and tell me, you know, if you see some potential problems with what we're doing, okay? Uh, you'll hear a lot of advice in the dog business. I mean, people love to give advice in the dog business and they love to talk in terms of absolutes. Like it's absolutely a bad idea to attempt to raise litter mates because the dogs will bond with each other or because they'll have extreme separation anxiety if they're not together or they won't be able to, to uh, form lasting and important relationships with other dogs, okay? Uh, I personally don't think that there's a lot of absolute rules in the dog business because I've been in the dog business long enough to see an exception for pretty much every rule, okay? I personally have raised tons and tons of uh, puppies that were litter mates and I've always had great success, okay? Now, I, I, I don't have great success simply because like the methodology that I'm using is like some kind of super magic secret dog training recipe, okay? There are no secrets in dog training, okay? There are some competing protocols for raising puppies, but ultimately uh, dogs and people have been living together for a long time, so there's nothing new. There's just variations on a theme, okay? Uh, there are people that are competent at implementing the pro protocols, and there are people that are incompetent, but amongst the people that are competent, they all have success with their chosen methodology of helping young puppies grow into responsible adult dogs. Okay, and that's what we're talking about. If you have a good methodology and you're willing to put the work in and you're competent uh, implementing the protocols, okay, is it a good idea to get litter mates? I would say the answer to that is a resounding yes, but based on uh, you know one overarching factor, which is what is the quality of the dogs that you're attempting to raise? You know, okay? So, like for me, I have access to, you know, generally high quality dogs and I have a great environment for bringing out the best in the dogs. So I don't have much trouble, but that does not mean that if I were to take two puppies, okay, that were of somewhat questionable temperament, that I wouldn't have trouble because I would. Because the truth is, I would have trouble raising one puppy that wasn't a suitable breed for the environment that I was putting it in, or it wasn't a suitable bloodline for the expectations that I had for the dog, okay? Now, with these two dogs, and this is why I like labs, um, it's generally pretty easy to find a nice, outgoing, healthy lab that uh, is, uh, you know, bred to work in conjunction with other dogs and with handlers, right? I mean, there's just a lot of labs that have been bred over the years to look at people and pay attention to people and also be able to, like, interact with uh, and get along with lots of other dogs. So this is an excellent breed of dog if you're attempting to raise litter mates, okay? Now, I've done the same thing with Malinois and we have had a little bit more trouble, haven't we? Haven't we, cameraman? You guys can go back though and watch tons and tons of videos where I raise whole litters of puppies or I raise multiple brothers and sisters and, and it works out, okay? But it doesn't work out without a little bit of trouble. I mean, of course, because the type of dogs that we used to raise, they were bred to be big and physical and, and super athletic and chase and bite people. So if you have one dog that's bred to chase and bite people, well, you can see where that's gonna be a little bit of trouble, right? If you have two puppies that are bred <laughs> It's chase and bite people. Uh, then you can see where that's going to be uh, like a, like a, you know, a, a, a double the trouble, as they say. Okay. But if you pick two nice, easy, outgoing puppies, right, that like food, that like attention, that like to chase a ball, and you go to raising them together, well, I mean, the only thing that's going to limit your success is your lack of work ethic or uh, maybe, you know, some type of environmental factor. Like maybe you don't have the proper work schedule for the puppies. Maybe you don't have the proper environment to exercise them. You know, maybe you don't have the proper temperament yourself to put up with, uh, you know, the kind of stuff that happens during the adolescent phase, uh, which is gonna happen to everybody, good dog or not a good dog. When they hit puberty, they're gonna be a little aggravating just like kids, okay? So let's look at these two dogs. Uh, do, does it look, stay there. Does it, ah, nope, you sit down now. 
does it look like those two dogs a ton of trouble to train? Okay, that's what I'm asking you. And we'll go and we'll walk them one more time. Very nice, okay. Very nice. Now, what I'm doing here, as I go to walking with the dogs, as I go to like trying to click and treat the dogs, come on, babies, as I'm talking to the dogs, do I have to be able to mentally get my head around the fact that my obedience exercises aren't going to look perfect? Well, of course. Do I have to, you know, get my head around the fact that if I make this too hard or if I make it too much like formal school, that these guys are going to go, hey, we'll just go hang out with each other because that teacher, he ain't very much fun to hang out with. Okay, I, yeah, I mean, of course I have to think about those things. I just choose to act in such a way where I'm interesting enough. Oh my gosh, these are good puppies. Where the puppies think that interacting with me, oh my gosh, is awesome, okay? And if I'm awesome, Okay, then they don't need to turn to each other to get away from having to interact with me. Like you see those dogs, they're both looking at me and they're both hanging out and they're both having fun being with each other. They both play together a lot, but they do appreciate this time where I bring them out here and I play this formal schoolwork game with them. And that's all I'm doing, guys, is this little clicker. This tells them that, uh, you know, that they've reached a point in the game where they've done something that I'm super excited about and every time they hear it, something good is going to happen to them. Now, for those of you who don't understand the clicker progression, basically what happens when these puppies are young, uh, we play this game with them until we've reached uh, what's known as the habituation threshold. And what that means is we've just done things enough times right so that it's become a habit. And in the dog business, habit is the really strongest motivator, okay? Just like with people. You know, you'll see a lot of people in life that are what I call motivation junkies. They're constantly chasing the next podcast or they're going to the next retreat where they can have somebody tell them how to be more motivated, where they can have somebody tell them how to, to, to stick to a system and realize their full potential, okay? That type of extrinsic motivation does not last with dogs, okay? And a lot of people that try to do like reward work like I, what I'm doing with these puppies right here, they don't understand that. And that's why you see them on Instagram a lot. Not making long form videos like me, but you see them on Instagram a lot where they'll have a whole handful of food and they'll be spinning their dogs in circles in between their legs and stuff like that. But you don't, out, you don't see them out mowing the yard. You don't see them out spreading grass seed. You don't see them out, uh, you know, working on their cabin and the dog's just chilling out and having a good time because those dogs aren't fully integrated into the trainer's lifestyles. Okay, and what we're interested in here is using a type of protocol that allows me to get enough successful repetitions during the formative phases that I create habit, knowing that habit is the strongest motivator that I have to keep an adult dog on the right track. Okay, now, so if I know that I can establish good habits in one dog, okay, and that that's going to help that dog turn into a really awesome adult dog, then why would it be such a stretch to think that I can do the same thing with two dogs? Come on, nerds. Okay, it's not. It's not a stretch at all. But again, like I said earlier, it's predicated on getting dogs that are going to be good dogs anyway. Okay, this is the real key with being an awesome dog trainer is you have to have the right dogs. It's just like being an awesome basketball coach or an awesome football coach or an awesome track coach. You have to pick the right genetics. Okay, so I'm sitting here saying that, that, that picking litter mates is great because, okay, I work for people who do their research and they pick bloodlines of dogs that get along well with other dogs and they have naturally outgoing and gregarious personalities for the most part. Now I do have a big dog here right now, a Central Asian Shepherd uh, from Tajikistan, and he's a lot of work, isn't he cameraman? I mean, when I say he's a lot of work, he's a lot of work. So w would that be a suitable dog to, to, you know, to try to raise litter mates of? No, you don't want to try to raise two Kangles. You don't want to try to raise uh, 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 two Central Asian Shepherds. You really don't want to try to raise two Pit Bulls or two Rottweilers. And I know all you guys out there that like those kind of dogs are going to disagree with me, and that's okay. Just put that in the comment section below. I mean, you can do that. What I'm saying, and I'm willing to stand by this, is that you need, if you're going to race litter mates, you need to pick dogs that are bred to work in conjunction with a handler and also to work in close approximation to other dogs. Okay, and that is what makes raising retrievers in pairs very easy because the dogs ultimately, come on, the dogs ultimately are bred, come on, the dogs ultimately are bred to do a job in conjunction with a handler while in the presence of other dogs. And so they have a genetic bias towards being able to pay attention to the handler and be happy and well-adjusted even though they're going to be 
in environments where they are not always the center of attention and that they will oftentimes feel like uh, the, the other dogs are getting to do the activities that they themselves would like to be engaging in. Okay? Think about a retriever. The retriever has to be able to go to the field and know that they're not going to be able to retrieve every single bird. Right? So there's our close approximation to, to, to other dogs, our close proximity to other dogs. They have to know that when the other dogs are fetching, that the other dogs are going to get a lot of attention and they're going to get like really made over. And so if Gunner goes and fetches a bird, Pearl has to be able to accept the fact that she's not going to get all the attention. She's not going to get all the activities. Okay? That's bred into the dogs. If you buy dogs, that aren't bred to do a job in conjunction with a handler or who aren't bred to do a job in close proximity to another dog, well then you're going to have a problem. Now that same thing applies if you buy a dog that was bred to do a job not in close proximity to the handler but in conjunction with other dogs. So I have a Catahoula Leopard dog here right now. Okay, now what Catahoula Leopard dogs do is they pack up and they run and they chase livestock or game animals and so here's the handler, and he lets him out of the truck. Here he is. Dogs get out of the truck and take off running. Handler comes and finds the dogs. So raising one of those dogs can be a little bit difficult. Raising two of those dogs can be very difficult because you started off with dogs that are not bred to work close in, in close conjunction with a handler while, we're, while simultaneously being in close proximity to other dogs, but not necessarily working with the other dogs. Now, now that's all, like, I might do, not be doing the very best job of explaining what I'm saying, but if you'll re rewind that, okay, I think you'll start to understand what I'm saying. When you look at a video of a dog, or you look at a painting of a dog, okay, and the dog seems to be doing a job where they're staying close to or looking to a handler for a person for direction, okay, in the presence of other people and dogs, then you know that that dog has genetic bias towards being able to be well adjusted, to pay attention to a handler, and to not be uh, interfered with by the presence of other dogs. If you watch a video where there's dogs and they're working together, maybe they're chasing a game animal or livestock, okay, and the handler is not in the picture, he's not in the painting, he's not in the video, okay, he's an afterthought, he's just the driver, he's the limo driver that takes them to party, right, okay those dogs are going to be more trouble. Does that mean you can't do it? No, of course not. It doesn't mean you can't do it. But what it does mean is that you might have a little bit of trouble doing it, okay? And when people have a little bit of trouble, then they make a big deal out of it, right? You got to remember on the internet, the most vocal people are people that really like something and people that really dislike something. So the people that will tell you, you know, how bad litter mate syndrome is, they've had bad experiences. Now they might have had bad experiences because they had an objective bad experience, but they also might have had bad experiences simply because they're weak-minded and they have a very low threshold for what they consider problems, okay? The same people that complain about uh, trying to raise, uh, you know, like litter mates, uh, are the people that complain about raising just one dog. And I know that because I've been in the dog business for my whole life. Okay, and uh, people that are, you know, really good at raising one dog, when I see them get two dogs, they generally raise them just fine because their threshold for being frustrated or bothered is just a higher threshold. They have more patience, they have more work ethic, they have more stick they did more research in picking the right dog uh, to meet their expectations, okay? All that stuff was in play. Now, so here we are. We walked these little dogs. We gave them some treats. We worked on some obedience, okay? And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let some other dogs out so that I can work with the other dogs. And what I want you to notice is that while I'm working with these different dogs, I'm encouraging them to hang out with each other, but I'm also encouraging them to make new friends, okay? And then I selectively reinforce them when they're making decisions that move them uh, from my perspective, in the direction of being more happy, well-adjusted, and confident puppies. Okay? Now, if you've ever been around human beings that have siblings, okay, having siblings doesn't mean that you're not going to grow up to be a well-adjusted person. Most of the time, it means you're going to be able to grow up to be a more well-adjusted person because you're going to have to learn to share, and you're going to have to learn to get along. You're going to have to learn you don't always get your way. Okay? Uh, so I would just apply that same logic to puppies. I think Having litter mates is awesome, and I'm going to go get some other dogs, and I want you to watch them. I want you to watch how they interact with the other dogs. And then, like I said, keep commenting below as the video progresses and tell me, you know, what I'm getting right, what I'm getting wrong, so we can kind of come to a consensus about whether, 
you know, my theory about raising puppies is the same as raising children. You just get them when they're young, have a bunch of them, right? And, uh, you know, keep telling them that uh, what they're doing is awesome. If they're doing awesome stuff, don't let them do bad stuff. And uh, then, you know, count on habit uh, in the post-pubescent period to keep them on the right track. All right, I'm going to go with some other dogs and uh, we'll see what they're up to. All right, so we went and let out a lot of dogs. We have an English Springer Spaniel. We have a Golden Retriever. We have a Curly Coated Retriever. Okay, and we still have Gun Gunner and Pearl. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk... Let's say, for example, let's say we walk Leroy, the Springer Spaniel, and we're going to walk Gunner, and we're going to see what Pearl thinks about Gunner going off and playing with Leroy. Okay. Now, if I'm doing my training protocols right, you know, like Pearl's not going to ha have any kind of problem at all with Gunner going off and playing with his friends because she knows that at some point during the day she's going to want to go off and play with her friends. And just because she has a brother and he has a sister does not in any way preclude them from thinking that their brother and sister shouldn't have some friends. Okay? If you have a brother and sister, right, <laughs> does it bother you that they have friends and they go do stuff with their brother and with their friends? No, of course not. Right? So look, everybody's getting along, and I'm going to say I appreciate Pearl being up here and being happy, and Leroy looks happy, right? Taylor looks happy, and Gunner looks happy. Okay, now we're going to continue working. Now, just like you might have a, you know, a sister or brother, and sometimes they have to go to work. Maybe they're working at uh, Five Guys or something, and you get to go party, right? Gunner, he's not going to get mad because Pearl gets to go party right now, and Pearl's not going to get mad because Gunner's at work. It's just a fact of life because that's how these dogs are being raised. <laughs> Come on, Leroy. We're raising them to understand that sometimes you get to do what you want to do. Sometimes you don't get to do what you want to do. Sometimes you get to be with your friends. Sometimes you have to be alone. You know, and we're just putting them in all these different situations and making them understand. Come on, nerd. And making them understand that like life has a lot of permutations. Okay? There's going to be some times when like you're the center of attention. There's going to be some times when you feel like you're getting ignored. And the faster that the dogs learn that uh, life isn't fair, well then the faster they're going to make progress towards being happy, well-adjusted uh, adult dogs. Come on nerds, you can do it. So in this situation, I'm paying a little bit more attention to Leroy and Gunner from the other dog's perspective. But from Leroy and Gunner's perspective, I'm making them work while the other dogs are off work and getting to go play and do what they want to do. You see? So there's not even a, there's not even a consensus on the dynamics of this situation, you know? See, this dog, he's saying, hey, Stoney, why aren't you letting me work? But see, this dog, he's saying, why do I have to be on the leash? This is what you guys have to understand, is that you have to put your puppies in positions where they get to experience the world from a variety of perspectives if you want to build temperamental resilience. And don't, you know, don't be so quick to look at a situation and say, you know, project onto another dog, or onto your dog, how the dog feels about that situation. Okay, you guys can kind of see this little Springer Spaniel. He's a dog bred to run away from a handler in a zigzag pattern, okay? So like his leash manners, probably never gonna be quite as good as uh, these Labrador Retrievers. Okay, he's wanting to hurry up and get through the course. Now here's what's funny about the various Springers, various flushing dogs, okay? They like to get done with the work, because they weren't bred to really do, you know, a complex job directly in conjunction with the handler, okay? They were bred to do a job kind of loosely in conjunction with the handler. But then when I let him off work, he's going to be pesky, and he's going to be right in the way of everything. All right, so let's say, let's say that I take him off the leash, right, and I'm going to put Samson on the leash, and Gunner can stay at work for a little while. Come on, come on, nerds. And you guys keep an eye on Leroy. Leroy is going to, he's going to go off and smell some things, and then he's going to come right back over here and start getting in the middle of what I'm doing. And this is what I'm telling you about picking the right kind of dogs to raise together. Now you'll notice that when I start working the Golden Retriever and the Labrador Retriever together, then it's pretty similar, right? See how Samson and Gunner, they just both hopped right in line here. They're both very familiar with these protocols and they're both very happy to work. We're going this way, nerd. They're both, both very happy to work in close proximity to the other dog. Now, here comes Leroy. You'll notice he pops in and out of the frame. Everything he does is in a zigzag pattern. So the complementary nature of the Golden Retriever and the Labrador Retriever 
it's not a one-to-one -one, you know ratio with complementariness of say the retriever and a flushing dog in other words two dogs from the same litter that have the same basic uh, genetic traits and tendencies in my opinion are going to be easier to work with than dogs that are not of the same litter not litter mates okay but have a little bit different uh, traits and tendencies very nice now so we see there that pearl is tagging along seeing what's up okay and there's perfectly that's perfectly fine there's nothing wrong with that. I'm going to say I appreciate it because she's being very calm, attentive, and polite. She's waiting to get her time to turn to do a little work. Okay. I'll take this leash off this guy. So let's go, let's go Labrador and, and Curly Coated Retriever. Come here, nerd. What are you doing? You're a very good dog. Now, you don't see very many of these guys. Okay. We're fixing to make a video on this Curly Coat next week. Okay, but so now Gunner's off work, so he can kind of go hang out and do what he wants, or he can tag along. Samson's off work, he can go do what he wants, or he can tag along, okay? But these two are, they're at work, okay? Now again, this is a matter of perspective. These other dogs are following me around right now, and they're thinking, hey, Stoney, why are you paying attention to Pearl and Maggie? But Pearl and Maggie might very well be thinking, hey, Stoney, why are we on the leash, okay? And I know that while you're looking at it, okay, it looks like everybody wants to be on the leash, okay? That's because everybody wants to play this game right now. But you have to understand that as the day progresses, the, the, you know, the sun is coming out and it's gonna start getting hot here in a second. The dog's perspectives are gonna become very important because once it starts getting warm and the dogs have got this initial burst of energy off, okay, then being on the leash it's not near as fun and ex as exciting as it seemed, but we still have to get it over with because we have a certain amount of formal schoolwork that has to get done every single day. Come on, nerds. Very good. Come on, come on. <laughs> there, you get down this way, and you get down that way. Go on. Very nice. Hey, what are you doing? Come on, nerds. Get up here so they can see you. Okay. You should be in the back because you're the tall one. All right, come on. Come on, come on. All right, so you see that we're walking and Pearl is walking right beside Maggie without much of any problem. Very nice. All these other guys are kind of tagging along. Some of them are getting in the way, wanting to be the star of the video. Very nice, but I don't see any problem here. I don't see that Pearl had any kind of meltdown because like she all of a sudden is not walking with her brother and her brother, wherever he went, he's over here. Look, he's just hanging out. Does he look worried or stressed or does he look like there's any kind of problem? No, he just looks like it's not his turn to be on the leash. Come on nerds, you can do it. Very good dogs. Very good dogs. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, you can do it, Maggie. Now, if you, if you read the breed standards of these curly coats, okay, the breed aficionados, they will tell you that this, these curly coats, which is the oldest, supposedly, known retriever breed, they'll tell you that they got labs beat in pretty much every category. Uh, I ain't sure that's true myself. <laughs> We're gonna try to do an in-depth in comparison next week, maybe. But look. Does Pearl look like she's having a problem with that at all? No, of course not. Very good dogs. Very good dogs. Come on, come on. Good. Okay, so now let's go. Come on. Come on, Maggie Meek Paul. Now learn to. Very good. Now, if you are going to think about raising litter mates, this kind of stuff that I'm doing right here, okay, this is another place where I feel like. Trying to raise litter mates has gotten, uh, you know, kind of a unfairly, unfairly put into the don't do category. Is people will tell you stuff like, make sure that you work with each dog individually. Eh, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, should you be able to influence one dog independently of the other? Well, of course, okay. But let's be honest. When you have multiple dogs, right, you are, you're very rarely going to go out and do something with one dog that you don't take the other dog. 
And I know it can be frustrating to try to influence multiple dogs at the same time because I literally do that all day long. Come on, nerd. Come on, come on. Uh, but like this right here is very important for the same reason that it's important uh, to have siblings because you get to, you know, you get to start to understand that you don't always get your way right now. Somebody, somebody else might be in the bathroom and you have to wait. Somebody else might have drank the last little bit, bit of milk and you have to drink water. Like somebody else might be needing to use the, the uh, washer and dryer and your stuff is not going to be it's not going to be, you know, clean by the time you're ready to go out on your date, okay? All of those things that when you look back on being a kid that you got a little bit aggravated with your brother and sister, those are the things that allowed you to develop temperamental resilience and allowed you to understand that, uh, you know, in life you don't always get what you want. And the key to being happy is to have met expectations, but the key to having met expectations is to be realistic in terms of what your expectations should be. Some very nice dogs. Very nice. Good girl. Sit, Maggie, meatball. Oh my gosh. Very good. Stay there. Very good dogs. Oh my gosh, very smart dogs. Okay, all right. So, listen, uh, that's kind of what I think about raising litter mates. I think if you start off with the right kind of dog, and that being the key, right, because some dogs are easier to raise than others. If you start off with the right kind of dogs and you pick you a nice set of training protocols that you're able to implement with consistency uh, and you're able to implement, you know, most importantly, persistently, you know, over the course of the dog's early developmental stages, you're going to be very successful. And you're going to be successful with one dog or two dogs or three dogs or four dogs or however many dogs you choose to be successful with as long as you have the work ethic to see it through. So I don't think that litter mate syndrome is such a big deal, right? As long as you have a good understanding of the type of litter mates that you're attempting to raise, okay? And you, and you have a good understanding of the amount of work ethic, okay, that it's gonna to take to see it through to the end because what a lot of people see uh, is too much Instagram, too much, too, too much social media where, you know, there's your attempts to influence the dog are these little short sessions and these little short sessions pay magnificent results. Uh, that's just not how the dog business works. If the dog business worked that way, uh, I would either be really rich or I'd be really broke, you know, because if I, if I was really fast, I could do a lot of dogs, but then again, if it was that easy, nobody would need me, right? So you got to think about that, okay? So, uh, in other words, like, get your pen and paper out and decide whether or not you have what it takes to raise one dog. And if you do, and you have the time and space and patience, and you want to get two, then I don't see anything wrong with it as long as you pick the right two dogs. All right, I'll see you guys next week.